Here we go. So this is the Rainforest's honor. Um, I, th this is an NAD honor, um, North American Division honor that was approved a couple years ago. Um, and look at the patch, it's one of the coolest patches I, in my opinion. Um, so when I was asked to teach an honor, um, I, we had a conversation and thought that this would be a good one to do because you can't find it, on, um, it taught online yet. So are we all ready to go? Yes, we are. I'm going to take that as a yes. Here we go. All right. Whoops. There we go. First requirement is describe a rainforest. So when you think of a rainforest, what comes to mind? Can anyone tell me what comes to mind when they think of a rainforest? You might think of all the plants and all the steamy jungle um, kind of scenery. Um, if you're like me, you might you know, start thinking about the animals that live there, the parrots and such. Um, how about big predators like leopards? You think of that? Or do you think about these things that, really, that I really don't appreciate? I do not like spiders. Do you think all the creepy crawlies, the snakes, the lizards? What, what do you think about when you, um, when you think about a jungle? You can throw that in the chat. But the official, um, um, the official definition of rainforest, it's, it's a noun and it's, um, this is what the um, dictionary calls it. It's a luxuriant, dense forest, rich in biodiversity, found typically in tropical areas with consistently heavy rainfall. All right, did that make any sense? Lots of big words in there. Yes, it does. Um, basically, um, a rainforest is a, is a forest, so lots of plants and often a lot of animals, usually a lot of animals. But the difference between a rainforest and another, uh, and another forest is that there's rain, lots of rain. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty straightforward definition, all right? So, yeah, in other words, it's a forest habitat and heavy and consistent rainfall. All right. Did you know half of all plant and animal, land animal species live in rainforests? All right, so half of all the species of plants and half of all the species of land animals live in rainforests. Now, this is really impressive because the rainforest only covers about 2% of, uh, of the world. So for half of all plant and animal species to live there, that's a lot of plant and animal species packed into you know, a really small space, okay? Keep that in mind, we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. All right, so this is a two-part question. State the two main kinds of rainforests and describe how they are different. And then the other part is diagram on a map locations of these two main kinds of rainforests identifying these types. All right. So the first part, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about two main kinds of rainforests, all right? There's two types, temperate and tropical, all right? Um, temperate um, trop, uh, temperate uh, rainforests, this is actually a rainforest, <clears throat> a picture of a rainforest near where I live in Washington. Yes, we actually have a rainforest in Washington state in the United States. Um, temperate rainforests, they, they grow midway between the poles and the equator. So about halfway between the North Pole and the South Pole and the equator, okay? Um, they have fairly cool temperatures. Um, for, for us in the United States, we say 32 to, um, to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. For you um, in um, Great Britain, it'd be zero to 27 degrees Celsius. So it's a fairly cool temperature. It has heavy fog, a lot of rainfall, about 100 inches or 250 centimeters per year. And it has two major seasons, wet, the wet season and the dry season. All right, so that's not to say that they only have two seasons. They actually have a spring and a fall, but those are typically, um, spring is typically a part of the wet season and fall is typically part of the dry season, okay? All right, so here's a map of about where the, um, the temperate rainforest would be. So this is where um, that picture was taken, right up here in the, um, um, in the Northwest corner of the United States. But you can see that um, all the way up along the, um, about like a third of the way down on the on our map, um, we have these green this green color, which is the temperate rainforests, and they're almost always along a coast, except for like right in here, so right along the water usually, and then again we have some more right down here at the bottom, Australia, um, New Zealand, um, the the western edge of South America. So if you look, if we put our equator about, and this is not perfect quite a perfectly drawn equator, but you can see that it's about halfway between the poles up here at the top or the bottom, and the equator, all right? Now, let's compare this 
to our tropical rainforests, okay? Tropical rainforests are grouped around the equator, all right? They have warmer temperatures, and that's about 20 degree, 20 to 29 degrees Celsius or 80, um, 68 to 84 degrees Fahrenheit. And they have a heavy fog and rainfall, just like um, temperate rainforests, but they have a lot more, um, or a lot more rain anyways. Between, a, uh, between 80 and 400 inches, which is a, um, 200 to 100, 1,000 centimeters per year. That's a lot, that's a lot of rain. And they typically stay the same temperature all year round, hot, muggy, humid, and you know, a lot of people will consider that pretty uncomfortable, all right? So here's um, where the uh, tropical rainforests kind of live, right, in, right along the center line of, the, um, of our world. There's our equator. You can see it's kind of evenly distributed on both sides. Most of it um, is gonna be, um, you got, there's a big section here in South America, <clears throat> um, some in Africa, <clears throat> and then a lot in Asia right there, all right? So, um, this is a rain meter. So this is how people, um, you know, you, you can measure rain yourself. If you just get a jar and set it outside, you can measure how much rain hits that spot in a week or a month or a year. Um, this is actually part of the weather honor. You could, um, um, if you make a, a rain gauge, you can earn part of the weather honor. But um, as you can see, they're measuring how many uh, milliliters of rain, I believe. I can't really see um, their measurement, but... Um, this little spot has collected over a certain amount of time, all right? Now, let's compare the temperate and the tropical rainforest rainfall, okay? So if you can see on the left of the, our little graph, this is in, this is in inches um, because centimeters was getting really big. Um, but um, you can see that um, a low rain, the low rainfall, so like the least amount that a temperate rainforest gets is about 50 inches. The highest is about 100, all right? And then on the other hand, Tropical, the least amount, it would be an 80, it would be about 80 inches or 400 inches. Now, to put this in perspective, this is how much rainfall falls on every little piece of the rainforest, okay? So if all the rain, from, all the rain came out once, the, um, the, the ground would be covered 400 inches tall in, um, in the tropical rainforest at the most, okay? And to put that in even greater perspective, this is about the size of a person. And so that's about six people on standing on top of each other. That's a lot of rain. So we're grateful that uh, number one, the rainforest absorbs all water, and number two, that it doesn't fall all at once. All right. All right. Any questions so far? Yeah. No look, questions so far. This is all, all right. Everybody's just listening at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Number three. Explain what causes so much rain to fall in rainforest biome areas. All right. So with all that water. Why is it coming, you know, why, why are, is it concentrated in these specific spaces, all right? So I'm sure you've all studied about evaporation, condensation, and precipitation, you know, how rain, how rain happens, right? Um, water evaporates from, from bodies of water. It cools and condenses, then it comes as rain, okay? So as, it, as, um, as, the, as air rises, warm air rises above cool air, right? And as it rises above water, it collects some water and takes it with it. All right. When it gets to the when it gets higher, it's cooler up there, and so it starts to cool. So the water starts to cool and condense into droplets. All right. So the the rain comes down because it's too heavy now. It, the air can't carry it anymore, and then that air that's now cool starts to sink because cool air is um, heavier than warm air. And as it sinks, it gets warmer. All right. So that's basically uh, that's a very basic cycle of how rain happens. Now. Let's take this to a larger scale, all right? There, um, if you look at this, um, because the Earth is round, they have these little zones, all right? If you look at the, our little arrows, that's the cycle that the, um, that the air is taking. Remember, coming back here, it goes up, cools, comes down, and warms, right? Right over here, you can see as it's, um, you can see where it would warm right here, as it's going up, it travels over here and it cools. Now, the reason that it's um, going in a circular pattern like this is because the Earth is round and it's spinning. So normally, it, you know, look up, up, up at the top of the world right here, right? And the bottom of the world right here, these are our Arctic zones. These are the cool places on the Earth, right? If the Earth wasn't spinning, what would happen is all the warm air would go up and it would travel all the way up here. And then it would cool, sink down, and come all the way back down here to warm up again. Now, do you know why the, um, the Earth is warmer at the equator? 
Anybody th want to throw that in the chat? All right. If you guys can put that in chat, that'd be great. Uh, Luke, uh, maybe you want to continue presenting, and then when they come in, you'll be able to see them as well. Here it is. Uh, people are saying close to the sun. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Um, the, sun, the equator is the closest to the sun, right? And so the, um, the hot air is going to be rising right here. Now, if the Earth wasn't spinning, it would go all the way to the poles, cool, and come back down. But the Earth is spinning. And so it doesn't have time to get all the way up to the poles before it cools. All right, so it does a shorter little circle. Now, here's something that's kind of interesting. There's a bunch of different zones, okay? And they actually circle in opposite directions, all right? So right here in the middle, it's our, our equator. And then these yellow lines are what are called course latitudes. I do not know why they call them that, um, but that's what they're called. And then again, we have our green lines at the top and the bottom. Those are our arctic circles, okay? So if you notice, right here at our arctic circle, we have air rising. Right here at our um, horse latitudes, the air is sinking. And then again, it's rising at the equator and sinking at the poles. Okay. Now, this is, um, this is the reason that some places get a lot of um, water and some places don't, other places don't. All right. If you notice, the warm air is rising at the equator. And as it rises, it's warm and it's collecting, um, collecting water. All right. So warm, wet air is rising. And when it gets to the top here, it's cold at top. So all the water condenses and it comes back down. All right. So the warm air is basically picking up the water from all the way up here and then dropping it right back here on the, on the purple zone. The same thing is happening up here, but since it's cooler and not so close to the sun, it's less. All right. Now, when that air cools and it drops all its moisture, it comes back down at our horse latitudes or at our um, Arctic zones. So there's not a whole lot of rainfall there. Did you know that the, um, the Arctic zones are considered deserts? So um, Antarctica and the Arctic up, up north, they're considered deserts because there's, not, there's hardly any rainfall, even though there's a lot of water there, even though it's covered in snow, there's not a whole lot of rainfall, all right? And so these, these yellow zones are where we get a lot of our deserts, all right? So the Southern United States and Mexico, the Sahara, um, southern, um, southern Africa and southern, um, and the southern part of South America, these don't get a whole lot of rainfall. And actually, all the air is all, all the water is getting pulled away to go to the, the equator or to our horse latitudes. Sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, sorry, I got confused for just a second. All right, so that's why we get water in these specific places. And that's why our temperate rainforests appear here and here. And then our tropical rainforests typically end up right around the equator. Now, there's another thing that's pretty interesting. Um, did you know that mountains can affect how much rainfall can fall in a certain area? All right. So just like And then as it cools, it gets ready to drop its rain. But let's say the clouds come up to a wall, in this case, a mountain. Okay, mountains can block a lot of the rainfall. So what happens is when they hit that, they can't really go over it as much. So most of the rain falls on one side, which means the other side can be a desert. That's why typically um, the, the water stays near the coasts because um, often there's mountains that are blocking the, the rain from getting further in, which means one side could be a, a, a forest that's all green and lush and the other side can be a desert, all right? All right, let's jump to um, number four. Draw a diagram showing the vertical layers of plants in a tropical rainforest and then label them, okay? So there's four main um, layers in a tropical rainforest. So as you can see here, we got a little picture right here um, and there's one, two, three, four layers going up. Can you see my mouse? Or am I just pointing to things that you can't see? No, I can't see the mouse. You can't see the mouse? Okay. No, no. Okay. Oh, okay. I, I can see now. I can see now. Okay. So it's moving around. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the, the bottom layer is called the forest floor. All right. Pretty simple. It consists of small plants and shrubs, and there's not much sunlight. Okay. The sunlight's blocked by the plants higher up. Okay. So this is where a lot of these small creatures will live. Um, any, anything that lives on the forest floor is going um, to be located 
um, are in these little plants and animals hiding right at the bottom of all the plants. Okay. Um, the next the next um, section is going to be called the understory. It consists of small shrubs, vines, large leaf plants, and even young trees, um, but they're rarely taller than 10 to 12 feet tall. And the reason for that is, again, there's not much sun sunlight. But what there is a lot of is humidity, because all these, because this entire layer of trees above it acts kind of like a greenhouse, keeping all the um, all the heat and all the um, humidity inside. All right. Now these trees up top are called the canopy. They are tall trees that block most of the sunlight from reaching the forest floor. So all the sun that hits them are going to get absorbed by these, which is why they grow so tall. Most dense and diverse layer. And it's between 100 and 150 feet or 30 to 45 meters tall. So pretty tall trees, all right? Now, interestingly enough, um, there's usually a big space between the bottom of the canopy and um, the top of the understory, you know, often several dozen feet. And that's because the understory can't grow high enough to reach that without, without the sunlight because these absorb so much of it for themselves, all right? Now, occasionally trees will pop out from the um, canopy and grow even taller by themselves, and that's called the emergent layer. So they're extra tall trees that grow higher than the surrounding trees, but there's, there's not a whole lot of trees that do that. It's relatively few, but they can grow upward of 150 feet or 45 meters tall. All right, those are our four major um, um, divisions of the tropical rainforest. All right. Now we're going to describe, draw, or use a hands-on demonstration to show how rainforests regenerate, which means replace lost or injured living organisms. Okay, so let's um, let's look at this. Here's a kind of a, a representation of that last slide that we just saw. Okay, we have an, our emergent layer, our canopy, and then this is our undergrowth or forest floor. All right. So as the sunlight hits the um, hits the canopy, it gets absorbed in. And so there's not a whole lot of um, opportunities for these little plants down here to grow, which means they have to either survive with relatively little sunlight or they die. All right. So what happens when a tree dies? One of the canopy trees, what happens when one of these die? Oops, there we go. It becomes mulch. Okay. If the log falls over and, it, um, and it's still re in re relatively one piece, um, it'll often, um, it'll be called a nurse log. A lot of organisms will either live in it or grow on it. And that provides nutrients for a lot of other plants. Now, this, um, with, with the space, now sunlight can actually reach down and um, feed these, um, these plants in the understory and these younger trees, which means one of these trees or several of these trees will grow up and fill in that spot eventually. All right. So a falling tree not only nourishes the um, the understory and the forest floor, but it also allows other um, trees to grow. All right. Okay, we're gonna play a game here. Um, there's actually um, more than five birds, but it says be able to identify five birds that live in the tropical rainforest. All right, we're going to um, identify several of them, but I'm gonna need some participation here. I need some help um, either in the chat or on Facebook uh, or on Facebook. We are gonna um, look at several different birds, but I'm only gonna show you a little piece of it of each bird. And you got to either guess or if you can, if you already know it, then just toss it out there. Um, the bird that uh, we are um, looking at. All right. And then after that, I'll uncover it and we'll talk about it. All right. You guys ready? Big fingers ready? We are ready. All right. Here's the first one. We're going to start with an easy one. All right. That's a pretty easy one. I'll bet you, you all know that yeah, one. Yeah, this is, a, this is a pretty easy one for sure. Uh, well, uh, well, let's see. Maybe it's not. Well, someone say, say it's a parrot. Okay, that's right. What kind of parrot? It's a specific kind of parrot. It says macaw. Yes, that's correct. It's called a scarlet macaw. Okay, there's actually several different colors of these, but this is probably the most commonly recognized one from a rainforest. And, and they are just very brightly colored and very easy to spot. All right, you ready for another one? All right, here's another fairly common one. And this is one that you'll see in pet stores and actually in a lot of science experiments. All right, so it's definitely a parrot once again. So you don't have to write parrot, but if you're able to kind of guess which one it is, that'd be great. Um, mm -hmm. I can have a go, but you know, in Serbia, maybe it's a different name for it. It's a, uh, a, a well, uh, they're saying different. I would say it's kakadu. Is it kakadu? Um, no, not quite. Okay, it's actually called an African gray parrot. Oh, African gray parrot, yes. 
And this is um, one of the most intelligent ones that they've studied, uh, um, intelligent species that they've studied. They actually have the cognitive ability, so the mental ability of a young child. They can, so they're as smart as some, as some young kids. Now, of course, young kids get smarter as they grow, or you know, they, they grow up and they are able to understand more things. But the parrots are very bright. They can talk, they can identify objects. And so they've been using a lot of different um, science experiments to study brain behavior. All right, ready for another one. I'm gonna guess you probably won't know this one, but it's actually pretty descriptive of its own self. If you look at what we have here, it, it, when I give you the name, it'll be pretty easy. All righty, let's have a go, Beryl. What is this? Mm, let's find out. Hey, hey uh, no, no, somebody said toucan, question mark. Not quite a toucan. What, what is it? Tell us. All right. This is a yellow-billed hornbill. I had no idea what that was before I looked it up. As you can see, yellow-billed is pretty descriptive of this thing. And hornbill looks like, you know, horns. So I guess I, I understand why they named it that. <laughs> All right. Let's do another one. This one uh, might be a little bit harder. This one is one of the only animals in the world that has a name that starts with Q. If that'll give you a hint. The letter Q. Your, your, your hint did not help, uh, Luke. Help us. All right. It's called the Quetzal or Quetzal, depending on how you pronounce it. All right. It's a little tiny bird. And it's I, I believe it's native to Australia. I could be wrong. Um, but as you can see, it's, it's actually quite beautiful and has these long tail feathers. All right. Now, I know I heard, I heard this a little bit earlier. All right. What's this one? All righty, let's go. Uh, toucan? Yes, that's correct. It's a specific kind of toucan. It's called the toco toucan. Um, there's actually several different varieties. Some of them have the, even rain, the rainbow beaks, but this is, um, this is a specific type of it. All right, I'll bet you won't guess this one, so I'm not going to give you a whole lot of time. Um, this is actually one of a, a variety of birds. It's called the greater bird of paradise. So birds of paradise are some of the most like unusual and beautiful birds um, in the rainforest. And there's a lot of different breeds. And so I'm just gonna skip to some of the other ones we have on here. The emperor bird of paradise, you can see his fluffy, fluffy tail. He's bright yellow and black. We have this Wilson's bird of par paradise, which looks like he's got like a, I don't know, like a rock for a helmet. And then we have the magnificent bird of paradise, which is kind of amusing. Um, you can see how all his like bright, shiny green um, chest that he blows out and when he's dancing for a, for a mate. So birds of paradise are, are, there's a bunch of different varieties and they're very beautiful and unusual, um, but they're again, harder to identify. All right. It looks like somebody's goldfish came, got out and you know started flying around. Any guesses what this one is? Probably not. This is an unusual bird. It's called the cock of the rock. Um, I don't know why they named it that, but it, as you can see, his head looks kind of like a goldfish. All right, and last one. Can you identify the bird? Can you see the bird? <laughs> There's actually two birds in this picture. Yeah, that's how it looks like. Maybe here, this might be a little bit easier. It's called the potu, all right? He keeps his eyes closed pretty consistently and they're really hard to spot, but um, it, it's good for, it's a great discovery. A little bit different, more of a race. Um, we have a bunch of junk, um, rainforest animals that we're going to um, that I'm going to show pictures of, and I want you to name Hey, Luke, uh, we are struggling to hear. Uh, maybe Luke, uh, just for maybe if it's okay for you to switch off your uh, uh, um, switch of your camera, maybe that will help us. Uh, so Good go on. without just go with audio. Go with okay. audio and your PowerPoint presentation. Maybe that will help us. Would you be able to repeat the last question? No apologies. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, we can. It's still dropping in, dropping out, but let's try. All right. Give me like two seconds. I'm going to change my internet connection. Maybe that will help. Uh, I'm not sure how good, you know, wise it is to do it in the middle of presentation, but hey, why not? All right. Just a second.
for her, for everybody who joined us today, this is the uh, this is the rainforest um, part fan owner, and our presenter is Luke. Luke, are we able to hear each other? Hello, Luke. Um, well, this is for sure. Uh, uh, Luke, it looks to me. Luke, are you still there? Uh, this is one of the honors that I will definitely not be able to teach. Um, uh, <laughs> so, so uh, let me let me see. Uh, Mark, are you around there or not? Uh, Luke, yeah, I am here. Yeah, uh, I'm assuming that you you wouldn't know too much, or maybe you do about this honor. You... Nope, I have nowhere close to Luke's ability. Oh. Yeah, he comes. He comes, Luke. Uh, Luke, uh, let's 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 hear you once again. Is that any better? Yeah, it sounds good for now. So let's go with that. Yes. Okay. Awesome. All right. Luke, go ahead and back up and say the question again so we can hear what the question yes. was. Yes. Okay. So the um, the requirement is be able to identify ten animals that live in the tree. And so we're going to try and um, I want you to name these as fast as you can in the chat um, as we go through them. Okay, there's actually more than ten, so just um, type them in there as quick as you can. All right. So the first one was an orangutan. Um, let me unusual animal. I'll bet you know it. I'll bet some of you know it. Any guesses? All right, guys. Uh, user chat section. It's kind of like a zebra. <laughs> it's, it's like a, a. There we go. I see it. I see it in the chat. It's an okapi. Um, it looks like a zebra, a, a mix between a zebra, a giraffe, and a horse. But it's actually an okapi. Um, it is an extinct and in, you often find in zoos. Hey, Luke, uh, we have once again a problem. Uh, uh, maybe um, I have a feeling that your previous internet connection was uh, better. So maybe, are you, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? It, there was a massive break there, but let's see. Okay, we can hear now. All right. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, I'm on my hard um, hardwire so i'm not sure why i think it's the i think it's the bird machine Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? No? I can. Pa Pastor Dayan's quiet at the moment. OK. Sorry about that. It was my fault. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Luke. OK, sorry about that. I'm not sure what, what's causing the issue with my internet. All right, so yes, yeah, so this is a tiger. That's pretty easy. All right, here's another one. Sloth. Yes, it's a sloth. You're right. It's a three-toed sloth. Um, believe it or not, they um, even though they're really slow, they actually swim very nicely. All right. A little bit harder. Anybody know this one? Yes, I see it. A tape hair. Yep. It's like a big wild pig. All right. This one's often com confused with another big cat. I think this is a uh, jaguar. It is a jaguar, yes. Thank you, Joshua. That was right dance. Joshua, if it's okay for you, please put the answers in the chat so everybody can have a go. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. This is a jaguar. They, they are native to the jungle. Leopards tend to be um, 
they, they tend to either live on the edge of the jungle or the rainforest or in the, um, in like the savannas and the drier areas. All right, you can't really see his head, but anybody know what this is? All right, people, right, let's use a chat. Okay, if somebody just said snake. Yes, oh. there we go, exactly. It is a snake, it is actually an anaconda. All right, massive snake. Um, it, um, you really can't see, but he, this is a picture from a, um, a zoo. The snake is actually 12 feet long and he's, his um, width is wider than my leg. So it's, it's really big. All right. Now this is, this is pretty um, easy to identify, but it's actually a specific type of bat. You're right. It is a bat. It's a Mariana fruit bat. So it's a large bat about, um, I think it's got like a, a wingspan of like a couple of feet, I believe. And, but he eats fruit primarily. All right. Big rodent. Anybody know what this is? No, no, we don't. <laughs> it's actually the world's largest rodent. It's called the capybara. All right. It's, um, it's a very good swimmer as well. And um, the size of a small dog. Depending how small your dog is, actually. It could be a large dog. <laughs> All right. Yes, this is a frog. It's a specific type of frog, only found in rainforests. Yes, it's a poison dart frog. There's all different types of um, poison dart frogs and it's um, colored the way it is to um, warn people that he is not a tasty treat. All right, a couple more. <laughs> Look at that tongue. That tongue is very useful for what, yes, there we go, anteater, anteater. That tongue goes into the um, into the ant's nest, and it's really sticky, and so you know it can grab the entire you know entire passageway. I believe this is the last one. It's not a really good picture, but you can kind of see trying to hide behind a, a plant, which is obviously not um, hiding him. Yes, it's a it is a, a rhino. It's a Sumatran rhino, or Sumatran rhino, depending on how you um, prefer to say it. All right. Um, these are one of the, um, the largest animals to live in the rainforest. All right, last one, I believe. I thought the last one was, um, I thought the rhinos were the last one, but yes, this is a gorilla. Um, this is a specific type of gorilla. It's supposed to, um, I believe it's a, um, uh, a, uh, like a Southland gorilla or something like that. Um, Cause not all gr um, gorillas live in rainforests. There are other, you know, they, they live in other parts as well, but um, this particular variety lives in the rainforest. All right. Good job, you guys. Good quick answers. Um, we're gonna go into number eight, list the predominant vegetation in rainforests. All right, so there's actually a difference. There's a significant difference between the vegetation in a tropical rainforest and a temperate rainforest. So tropical rainforests, here's some, um, here's some examples of the types of leaves, the types of plants. Um, if you notice, there, the plants typically have really wide leaves. See, the, the, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, this tree, Cacropia um, tree has these wide leaves. The banana tree, which is actually a shrub, um, also has really wide leaves. Um, same with the rubber tree. Um, and these are useful because, um, especially when they're shorter trees, they need to collect a lot more light. When they're larger trees, they're, they're trying to collect as much light as they can from everyone else. So. Um, in the tropical rainforest, light is the biggest commodity. Everybody, all, all the plants want light. Now, in the um, temperate rainforests, you also do have some wide leaves, kind of like the cottonwood right here and the red maple. But you typically have a bunch of, um, they're called um, coniferous trees because they have cones, pine cones. And they have little needles along them. Um, here's a Sitka spruce, western hemlock. Other, other trees would be um, white pine and Douglas fir. Um, these would be trees that you'd often find in there as well. All right, moving on to number nine. What is an epiphyte? Be able to identify from pictures three plant examples. An epiphyte is a plant that grows on a host plant. All right, a host plant is basically another plant that is just, you know, that it's using as a, um, as a home. Now, um, it's different from a parasite. Parasites are also plants or animals, in other words, um, that, that grow on a host. A parasite plant would be a plant that grows on a host plant. Um, 
For, but the difference between an epiphyte and a parasite is the epiphyte doesn't harm the host plant. All right. So, um, and then it also, so it gets its nutrients from compost. So like if uh, like tree leaves start composting in a, like a, a pile somewhere near or on the plant, on the host plant, the epiphyte can grow using that compost. It also can take its nutrients from the air and gets watered by rain. All right. On the other hand, a parasite does harm the host plant by stealing nutrients that the host plant grows. So what it actually does is it, um, it finds a way to start um, to take the stuff that the host plant was growing, was taking for itself, and it uses it instead. Um, parasite plants will often um, destroy the host plant. Epiphytes may, all, may actually help the host plant. All right. So here's a, um, a couple um, examples of epiphytes. So we have this one right here called the tang bromelade, and it collects water. So it, it can actually um, be a, a its own little like um, a, like its own colony of, for other plants and animals because a lot of uh, like small frogs and tadpoles and insects will actually use this water in here as their nesting ground. Um, if you look in this like onion type um, plant right here in the bottom left corner, bottom right corner, um, I. Don't exactly know how to pronounce this. If if one of you knows how to pronounce it, that'd be awesome. But I'm gonna try to say this without slaughtering it. My or Myrmacodia. That's what I'm gonna go with. Um, this is um, it. Actually, the root system it like holds around the tree, so it supports itself, and then it um, it also provides ha uh, habitat for ants. And the ants help protect the tree from other invaders. So while it's getting its nutrients, it doesn't actually use the nutrients from the tree. It uses its own but it also provides um, protection while it's being supported. Up here we have lichens. Lichens are common on lots of different trees. You've probably seen them before. Um, and uh, so they grow on the outside. They act like a, a sheath. They can be an extra skin for the, um, for the tree, but they also use that for support and get the nutrients from the, from the ground and from the air. Um, over here we have orchids. Orchids are a common flower, but they are actually really hard to grow. And they also are um, epiphytes that um, use a host plant to um, grow. All right. There's actually a lot more of them, but they're a little harder to pronounce <laughs> and, um, and a little less common. Number 10, learn about one invasive species that affects the rainforest. All right. Now, invasive species, I'm sure you've, um, you've heard about, and you've probably studied some of them in school, or you've maybe earned, the, um, earned other honors that talk about invasive species. But I'm going to give you uh, like a modern day example of an invasive species that affects that affects that is currently affecting the rainforest. Okay, hippopotamus. All right. <laughs> now, where do hippopotami or hippos live typically? Any guesses or <laughs> anybody? Know know? We are having the answer Africa. Africa. You are right. They're typically in Africa, um, and that's. Um, it's unusual for them to be anywhere else unless they're in zoos. Now, um, in the, in the mid 1900s, there was a, a drug smuggler who, who lived in South America and he was very rich from his illegal drug smuggling. When he died, they found he had an entire zoo at his house, including four hippos. Now, looking at these pictures, you would not know this, but hippos are one of the, one of the world's most dangerous animals. They're really big and they're really aggressive. And their teeth can they, can, they can chomp small boats in half with their teeth in one bite and they're very territorial. And so when the people came to, um, to, take, a, to take a zoo and take, them to the, take a zoo animals to an actual zoo, they looked at the four hippos and they're like, we don't wanna deal with those. And so they, all they did is they released them into the South American jungle. So now there were four hippos in the South American jungle and they thought they would just die and then everything would be okay. But unfortunately, in Africa, where the hippos live, they have predators. In South America, they do not. And so the hippos started breeding. And because there was, no, um, there was no predators to keep their population down, they kept breeding and breeding and breeding. So now there's about 60 hippo hippos living in, um, in the jungles, the rainforests of Colombia. And there's no way to, to stop them from, from continuing to breed. So now you might think that's not much of an issue, but it, it actually is an issue because um, when you think about it, in the rainforest, there, um, in the, um, the forest floor and the undergrowth, the plants that live down there are typically not very strong. And so a hippo 
that are, that's like you know bumbling through the forest uh, or the rainforest is squashing plants left and right and a lot of these plants are endangered remember the rainforest is only two percent of the world's um covers only two percent of the world and for um all these all these plants and animals that um, that live there that are endangered, um, a massive animals such as a hippo can destroy entire populations of endangered animals. Um, in addition, it's it can also harm humans because they're so aggressive and the people in Colombia are not used to having to do with hippos and so they don't know what to do with them. And so hippos damage crops, they damage trees, they um, you know they muddy up swamplands and um, when they're wallowing in the mud and so they can be a very big danger. Now, this is, um, this is an example of an invasive species that humans brought over. There's lots of other ones. So if you um, look them up yourself, that, um, you'd find a lot of different um, opportunities to study those. All right. 11, what are some renewable resources that rainforests provide for humans? All right. This one, um, this is probably one of the most common um, thought of ones. Do you know what this is? This is a bunch of bananas. They grow upside down and in large bunches such as this, okay? We'll talk about bananas in a little bit, all right? So one of the um, primary things that affect us from rainforests is they provide food, such as bananas and other fruits. Now, this is a little more, um, lumber can also be a, um, a renewable resource, but the, the key is um, the lumber has to be renewably sourced renewably sources and taken care of. So if you look at this forest and you look at that forest, do you think that this forest is being renewably cared for? Probably not, all right? One of the uh, biggest problems is what they call rainforest deforestation, which is basically a, a big word for cutting down all the trees. You can't have a rainforest with no trees. So when you cut down all the trees, and you don't take care of your rainforest and you don't plant new trees, you, you have less and less rainforest. And if there's only 2% of it left, of the rainforest left, there's, there's not a lot of opportunities for the endangered species living there to continue living. So you end up with a lot of extinctions and a lot of, um, a lot of problems. And that's also an issue because rainforests also provide a lot of our oxygen. Remember, um, plants take carbon dioxide, which is what we breathe out, and turn it into oxygen. So we breathe oxygen, they bring, breathe carbon dioxide. So it helps to keep everything in balance. When there's fewer trees, there's fewer plants to help take care of, um, help change carbon dioxide into oxygen, which means um, they, there's not as many plants to clear our air. All right. Any questions before I move on? Going once, going twice. Sounds like no. Okay. Number 12, list at least three ways that rainforests can be protected. So with all this rainforest de deforestation and other things that can damage it, the biggest thing you can do is be an advocate. An advocate is um, someone who speaks out for, um, in favor, you know, to support rainforests or, or another cause. And the way you can be an advocate, you can be a tourist raising money for, um, because if you travel somewhere and go visiting that um, the rainforest, it raises money for the local economy. So when you're paying them, you know, because you're staying there, you're eating their food and such, um, this encourages the people who live there to take care of the rainforest because then more people like you are going to want to come and see it. If they cut it all down, then they're not going to get the money from people like us coming down to visit. All right. Also, we can avoid buying exotic pets. What this does um, is Exotic pet, uh, the exotic pet trade can um, damage endangered species. It can also hurt the animals. And so um, by not buying these exotic pets, um, it discourages the animal track, um, the, the illegal animal traffickers from taking these animals from the rainforest. Um, also um, taking animals out of the rainforest can alter the natural balance because there, there can be fewer an, um, predators or fewer prey. You can also choose to use products, rainforest products specifically, um, that are harvested sustainably from the rainforest. So if you're gonna use rainforest wood, then make sure that that rainforest wood has been taken care of, um, or that rainforest that the wood came from has been taken care of. Don't use um, products that have, been, um, that have been harvested in a way that damages the rainforest. 
And the other thing is you can raise funds for conservation, specifically for um, e even buying land from the rainforest that'll be set aside to preserve or um, you know, raising funds to go plant new trees and things such as that. All right, these are all ways that you can help protect the rainforest. Number 13, prepare an object lesson about a, about a plant, animal, or bird that lives in the rainforest. Share this lesson with a group setting, such as a club, unit, worship, or a children's story in church, or a campfire, or vespers. Okay, so this is something you're gonna need to do on your own, but we're gonna give you an example in just a moment. So when you're preparing an object lesson, you want your topic to be, you want your object lesson to be short, your topic to be specific, and you wanna find, you wanna talk about something that you find meaningful. If you don't find it meaningful, it's gonna be hard to convince somebody else that it's meaningful. So this is something that um, Mr. Marco Phil um, kind of let me borrow. It is a, um, a way to help you build your own um, object lesson. So number one, it says, ask yourself one of two questions. What object do I wish to use to build the lesson? Rock, invasive species, flower, etc. All right, and number two, what lesson do I share? Do I want wish to share that I need to find an object for? All right, and then, oops, hold on, there we go. Uh, and then the second point is, what is the main point I wish to share? Keep it one sentence. Keep it nice and short. Remember, object lessons are not long sermons. They're just a five minute, maybe maybe ten minute um, little um, worship thought. Number three, find a fact or two about your object lesson that have parallels with your Bible truth. And number four, be sure you plan to end with the main point, sentence, and then stop. All right, so I'm gonna give you a brief, I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second and turn on my video. I'm gonna give you a brief example of um, a, um, a rainforest object lesson that I have, all right? All right, can you see me again? Yes, I can see you. Yes, we can. Anybody know what this is? Mm -hmm. It's from my breakfast. <laughs> Banana. I don't have a whole lot of rainforest um, things that are around me, but I do have bananas. And if you look at the little label, I'm not sure if you can see it. Whoa, where's my camera? It says right at the top here, it's from Ecuador. Ecuador banana. I'm in North Idaho. Uh, I'm in Washington, actually. So uh, Washington is in the Northwest of the United States. That's on the other side of the world, basically. Like thousands and thousands of miles away. This banana has come thousands of miles away for me to eat it. All right, bananas are really healthy things. Um, we had a, um, when there was a, um, an epidemic, an Ebola epidemic um, that started in Africa and it started to spread and people were really worried about it. One of the things that could help keep people safe and keep people and, and help people heal was eating bananas. And not only that, but, um, but they, um, they have good um, fiber and they have other good things that are um, really helpful for you to eat. And, they're fun to look at. There's not a whole lot of fruit that look like this, like a smiley face. So, you know, um, it's really interesting though, that to have this banana, how many people, how many things had to work together to get that banana from Ecuador to, to Washington? How many hands did it have to pass through? And, and for this banana to still be in good shape for me to eat. You know what, you know what else came from a long ways for us? And that's Jesus. Jesus came from a long way away. He was not, he was not a human before he came to earth. He became a human just for us so that we could, um, so that we could um, have eternal life so that we could be saved. All right. That's just a short little object lesson. It's not even five minutes. I'm running out of time. So I'm going to keep it pretty short. But I want, I want you to think about that next time you eat a banana. Where did it come from? And why did it come all the way from Ecuador? or wherever it comes from for you. Just like, why did Jesus come all the way from heaven down to us? All right, I'm gonna share my presentation and we're gonna finish up real quick. All right, last requirement. We're gonna do at least three of the following activities. A, visit an exhibit or conservatory of rainforest trees and or plants. B, make a collection of at least three types of epiphytes. C, visit a zoo where there are animals typical of the rainforest biome. D, watch a video about the rainforest or plants or animals that live there. E, draw up or paint a picture of something you had fun learning about while studying the rainforest. Or F, as a group, make a short video about a real life 
um, rainforest conservation project. Explain why this specific habitat should be saved. All right, so we're gonna do two of these right here. Some of these you, you would need to either go somewhere, you might be able to um, visit a conservatory online for rainforest trees and plants. Um, collecting epiphytes, um, if you have trees nearby, you probably have lichens of some sort. You could collect those easily. Uh, or you could also visit a zoo. Um, a lot of zoos have gone online because of the pandemic. So you can visit, um, you know, at least virtually visit um, the animals in the rainforest biome. But we're gonna do two of these right now. We're going to first watch a video about the rainforest or plants or animals that live there. And then also E, um, draw or paint a picture. All right, we have two short videos, one right after another. So hold on tight, they're about five minutes long. Ready, here we go. Just three forest basins, the Amazon, the Congo, and Borneo Mekong, account for 80% of the world's tropical forests. These three forest ecosystems are home to many of our planet's treasured species. From big cats to great apes, dolphins to butterflies, an untold variety of flora and fauna depend on these forests. They also provide a livelihood for more than one billion people and support life on Earth for every single man, woman, and child. Globally, forests and their associated river systems and wetlands regulate and stabilize the climate. They can also fuel the economic engines of developing nations, if they are managed sustainably. Despite their enormous value to people and nature, these forests remain an undervalued resource. More than 13 million hectares of forest are destroyed worldwide each year. Although the rate appears to be in decline, this level of forest loss is not sustainable. This loss of forest increases greenhouse gas emissions and land degradation, threatens biodiversity, and puts at risk the homes and livelihoods of indigenous peoples who have depended on these forests for generations. Over the last 10 years, significant progress has been made in developing policies designed to slow or halt the loss and degradation of these forests. Legally established protected areas cover an estimated 18% of these rainforest basins, and more than 210 million hectares of forest have management plans. 83% of the forests are publicly owned. 21% of the forests are primarily used for production of wood and non-wood products. 14% of the forests are designated for the conservation of biological diversity, and 7% of the forests have soil and water conservation as their primary objective. The level of deforestation and degradation varies from one forest basin to another. Yet the countries that house these dynamic ecosystems share many challenges. Each is striving to find the right balance that allows for economic growth while protecting the resources on which its people, and indeed the planet, depend. At the United Nations General Assembly in September 2007, 11 tropical forest countries came together to form the F-11 whose mission is to promote unity and solidarity among forest developing countries. Together, they're working to ensure greater contributions to the regulation and stabilization of the climate and the fight against poverty. Borneo Mekong, held during the International Year of Forests, solidifies this commitment to the sustainable management of forest ecosystems. A new formal framework for consultation and discussion is one way to help tropical forest countries manage shared challenges. It is an acknowledgement that no nation can address the issues of climate change and biodiversity loss and isolation. Countries attending this summit seek cooperation with each other and the rest of the world. Together, we can create solutions and mobilize resources to improve management of these vital global forests. All right, so there's one. And the second one is actually gonna be 
um, connected to part E, we're going to actually watch a video and we can draw along as they, um, as, uh, oops, there we go, as they draw a toucan. It's going to be about six minutes. So go ahead and grab a paper and a pencil or uh, a marker and we're going to watch them as they draw. So I'm going to give you like about 30 seconds or less. Let's make it like five seconds and then we're going to watch this video. Are you guys ready? All right, here we go. Hey, Austin, tell our art friends what we're going to draw today. A toucan. Toucan. It's a bird with a really long beak. beak. Yeah. You got your marker? Yeah. All right. We hope you get to follow along with us. You got something to draw with and some paper. 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 Yeah. And if you're using a marker, you want to make sure that you have at least two sheets of paper so that your marker doesn't soak through and get onto the table. You ready to draw? Yeah. We're first going to draw our toucan's eyeball. And we're going to draw it right in the middle of our paper, and we can draw it kind of big. So let's draw right, right about here. We'll draw the circle. And then let's draw another circle, a small circle, in the top right. Yeah, now let's color in the big circle, but leave the little one white. Now this little white circle is the shiny part on our eye. And you can draw that on any eye for any drawing. You ready to keep doing our toucan? Yeah. All right, now we're gonna draw a circle that goes around this because our toucan's gonna have a big eye. Well, that's a really big eye. <laughs> yeah, oh, super big. <laughs> Your toucan's gonna be crazy. Okay, now we're gonna draw his beak and we're gonna start right above his eye and we're gonna draw a big curve like this and then down. So start right here and we're gonna draw a curve that goes all the way maybe over to there. Cool. Now, right here at the end, let's curve it just a little more down. Perfect. Now we're going to draw this smile, his little smile. We're going to draw an S line. We're going to curve up and then back down and then curve into his eye. See how it curves both directions? One way and then back the other way and into the eye. Yeah, I like your beak. It looks awesome. Now we're going to draw the bottom of the beak. We're going to draw another curve that comes down like this below the eye. So we're going to start right here and we're going to draw a curve that comes over to there. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> Next, let's draw his body. We're going to draw a curve that starts over here on his beak and it's going to curve down like this. And then we're going to stop right there. So start right there and curve down to that point. Yeah. Keep going. And we're going to draw the other side of his body. We're going to draw a curve that comes down and matches the other side. Do you see that? See how they come down to the same? So we're going to start there and come down to about there. Now let's connect these two lines, the bottom of his body. Perfect. All right, we've finished his body and his beak. Let's add all of the little details inside of his beak and his body. So right here, we're gonna draw another curve that comes up and connects to his eye. So right here, connect up to his eye. And then we can draw a curve going the other direction, connecting to the top of his head. Yeah, now we're gonna draw a little circle or U that goes around his eye and back up. <laughs> now let's draw his belly. We're going to draw an upside down U for his belly. <laughs> now let's draw the lines on his beak. We're first going to draw a little one right here on the end of his beak, a little curve. And then we can color in the tip of his beak. Now, if we ever go too fast, what can our art friends do? Pause the video. Yeah, you guys can always pause the video if you need extra time to finish a step. You ready to keep going? Yeah. <laughs> now we're going to add a couple more lines on the top of his beak. We're going to curve this direction. And we're going to do another one right next to it. Curve the same direction. All right, now let's draw his feet. We're going to draw two U's. One like this and one over here for the other foot. Yeah, and then another one. And then inside of the U's, let's draw two lines like that 
and we could draw two lines on the other one. Yep, and then two on the other side. Perfect. Now we're almost done. We need to draw his tail, but before we do that, let's draw the branch that he's sitting on. We're gonna draw a wiggly line like this. He's sitting on it, and then we're gonna draw the other wiggly side of the branch coming out over here. So we start right here, draw out to there. Yeah, and then another one over here. Good. Now we could draw the bottom of the branch like this, and then we'll go in between his legs and then out the other side. Uh-huh. Yeah. You did it. Good. Now let's draw his tail. We're going to draw a curve going this way and a curve going the other way. Two curves going opposite directions. Yep. One going to the left and then one to the right. And then let's connect them with a curve at the bottom. All right, dude, we did it. We finished drawing our two cans. Yours turned out awesome. I love them. Now, we still need to do one last thing. What is it? Color it. Yeah, we're going to color our two cans. They're going to look so much better once they're colored in. But this part, we're going to fast forward. At the end, you guys can pause it to match the same color. You ready to fast forward? Yeah. Austin, you did it! You finished coloring your toucan and he turned out awesome. I especially love it when it's all colored in. What was your favorite part? The eye. The eye? You like the big giant eye? Yeah. I like it too because he looks a little cuckoo. Maybe he's a cuckoo bird. A cuckoo toucan. <laughs> now it's okay that our drawings look a little different, right? Yeah. Yeah, because the most important thing is... To have fun. Yes, to have fun and to... Practice practice yeah we hope you guys had a lot of fun following along with us and drawing your own two cans did you have fun you promise yeah <laughs> and we'll see you later our friends goodbye goodbye if you had fun following along in this lesson be sure to subscribe to our youtube channel by clicking the circle then you can click the bell to get notified every time we upload new videos i've also picked out these two other lessons i thought you'd really enjoy don't forget to take a photo of your child's finished artwork and share it on facebook instagram and twitter because we want to see how awesome it turned out okay we're going to skip through that. All right. Hey, uh and that is the end of the honor. So you have two things to do. The first one is to do your object lesson and share that with um, with your club or with your family or with your um, your class. And the other thing is to choose um, one of the um, other um, options and complete that. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing then. Do we have any questions? Any last?